Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We have a famous director, Leslie Stevens, to profile, and the wonderfully talented actress, Lisa Liu. Lisa was born in Beijing and raised in Shanghai, where she was surrounded by people in the arts. Her mother was a legend in the Chinese opera, and her godfather was a celebrated actor. Her daughter, Lucia Huang, is a gifted musician and composer. Lisa attended the university in Shanghai, in Hawaii, and then studied at the Pasadena Playhouse. She's won awards all over the world, and she's been acclaimed both in America and China for the last 25 years. There's so much to tell about her. Film, The Last Emperor, stage, The Flower Drum Song. Uh, she was a producer on Lotus, television, China Beach, and she's lectured to promote Chinese culture. How does one promote Chinese culture, Lisa? Well, to introduce the uh, Chinese uh, arts to Americans and the American plays to China. Um, I translated Neil Simon's uh, uh, Plaza Suite and took it to China. I uh, played the three roles. Oh, you did play yes. in it as well? Uh -huh. You did the translation yes. and then you acted in it? Yes. Uh, they've never heard of uh, Neil Simon before. Uh, as famous as he is and that's the first time people heard of him and that's the first time they were acquainted with his style of writing. Did they l laugh about it? Did they get the jokes? <laughs> yes, they laughed at all the right moments, <laughs> all the, yes, all the responses you would have in an American theater. You didn't have to hold up cards and no. say this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> I was very happy. That, that was great. Yes. And then I know in America you do uh, you you teach and lecture on um, the Chinese opera. Uh -huh. We perform also in schools in universities. Uh, but, do you perform? Yes, but now we don't have to do that. Now all the Chinese performers can come. Oh, so, so before? We, yes, before uh, in the sixties, uh -huh. in the seventies, yes, we did a lot of that. So. Um, now, is there any part for an exchange? Do you arrange for the Chinese uh, opera people to come, or do you still have a, a hand in it? Well, the first one which came to Metropolitan um, Opera House, mm -hmm. I tried to arrange it. I and uh, now they uh, annually they have something coming. I see. Yes. Why did you leave China for America? Well, I left China at the time to come to America to study. I, uh, I went to Honolulu, studied at the University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did you um, then decide to stay, or were you back and forth When I came, uh, the China wasn't liberated, and only after I came, uh, then I couldn't go back because there's no communication between mm. the new regime uh, with U.S. So you stayed? I stayed. Were you acting then? Were you interested? No. Oh, I, you I was interested, but uh, <laughs> I was never an actress. You yes. know, as I got to the end of your bio, it said that you were a business major. Yes. Yeah. Were you? My uh, family wanted me to be a banker. Oh. So I studied uh, financial administration. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. Then how did you get into acting? I love acting. I wanted to be an actress, uh, an opera singer, but uh, I was told uh, I should stick with banking because I was good in mathematics and my family is in the banking business, so I should stay in that field. But your mother was a singer. Yes. Do you think you picked up those genes? Yes, I think so, <laughs> because all our friends, when I was younger, they're all beautiful artists, famous artists. So. I, uh, uh, I was influenced by them, I guess. Um, 
when did the Pasadena Playhouse come into your education part? Uh, uh, after I came to California, mm -hmm. and then I, I couldn't forget acting. <laughs> and uh, I worked in a hospital, and I was, I, I was advanced to a, a business controller. And, uh, oh, you were? You were yes, always back to yes. members but, again. <laughs> yes. But then I, that was before I was an actress, mm -hmm. because then I felt so monotonous. Every day you look at the same figures, the same thing. So I went back to school. I went to Pasadena Playhouse. It's a wonderful playhouse. I think yes. uh, they have wonderful productions, mm -hmm. and they've been very instrumental in a lot of uh, careers, act, acting careers. At the time, you finished the Playhouse, it must have been the 70s, and were you looking? 60s. Oh, it was still the 60s. Were women's roles very plentiful at that time? Um, not much, because I am Asian, mm -hmm. and uh, so for an Asian woman, there's not m many parts. Well, I wondered if, uh, they said the women's roles were difficult, but I thought maybe you would have a, a better chance because you were Asian. Maybe there were different roles that were geared to you. Well, I'm lucky because I'm Asian, there's less <laughs> competition. Right. Right. But because I'm an Asian, mm -hmm. there's less roles also. Uh, so. When did you go to Broadway? I've never played on Broadway. I oh. wish that in this life I can still go on Broadway. Oh, but, well, then when did the stage come in? Where was the stage work? Uh, the stage work when I graduate, where upon my graduation, our president was uh, uh, Mr. Brown, um, who uh, gave staged the Tea House August Moon for me oh. to to showcase for me. Oh, I see. You and, did the Tea House of yes, the August Moon. and later Moon? I did uh, the. Uh, uh, Susie Wong, World, right, of, the Susie world Wong. of Susie Wong, and then uh, later I did the Flower Drum Song. Did you and, sing in that? Uh, yes, so I played the bride from China. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, during those productions, were were they always um, geared just for you? The mm. the did they did they mount those just for you? Uh, not for the Susie Wong or uh, Flower Drum Song. It, no, it's not for me. Only for the first one, my uh, the principal of the school mounted it just oh, for see, me. I see. I see. And then you were in One Eyed Jacks with Marlon Brando. Yes. So how did that role come about? Uh, they I auditioned for it, and uh, they saw many many uh, people, and uh, l so uh, narrowed down to. Me. <laughs> it was that a, and then Mountain Road with James Same Stewart. Thing. They uh, auditioned all over the world for that role, and uh, I think uh, the producer bought the property for Miko Taka because ah. she has just finished the Sayonara, and uh, because that role is not a glamorous role, it's it's a uh, wartime black uh -huh. and white, uh -huh. so Columbia sort of uh, wanted to scout for the best uh, person for the role. So I, I, I was chosen. That was great. Mm -hmm. then, then did uh, flower, um, oh, The Last Emperor come along? Oh, The Last Emperor is a very <laughs> interesting uh, story. Uh, Bertolucci saw me in the Little Foxes uh, picture, because I did Little Foxes in Sh Hong Kong, in uh -huh. Chinese. Uh -huh. That was translated into Chinese. And uh, you know, uh, Regina is very, with period cl clothing. So he thought maybe he can have me play one of the princes who was educated in Europe because mm -hmm. her father was an ambassador. Mm -hmm. And I was happy. And uh, about two years later, he said, oh, I'm sorry, this per character has to be taken out because too many characters and it's confusing and there's no room for you. So I said, how about the Empress Dowager? You must have her. So he's, oh yes, but she's already 85. I want <laughs> an old woman to play her. I don't want to put on makeup. Uh -huh. So I thought I had no chance, but uh, a year or so afterwards, I saw him in Beijing. And he was uh, holding his production because he couldn't find the right person to play the Empress Dowager. <gasps> So I, I saw I saw him and I said, you don't need an old lady, you need a good actress. Oh, that's fabulous. So, 
So they did get a good actress. Then, uh, then came uh, the Joy Luck Club. We have a clip from that. I want to make sure we get to see that. So uh -huh. let's see that, and then we'll go back and talk about your director, Wayne Wang, yes. and your director, Bertolucci, and how yes. it was to work with the two of them. Thank so you. we'll watch Lisa Liu in the Joy Luck Club. Mom, what does it mean? What should I do, Mommy? I tell you the story because I was raised the Chinese way. I was taught to desire nothing, to swallow other people's misery, and to eat my own bitterness. And even though I taught my daughter the opposite, still, she came out the same way. Maybe it is because she was born to me and she was born a girl. And I was born to my mother, and I was born a girl. All of us like stairs, one step after another, going up, going down, always going the same way. But no, this cannot be. Just, just not knowing what you're worth. This not begin with you, my mother, not to know her worth until too late. Too late for her, but not for me. Now, we will see if not too late for you. Lisa, you played a mother in this film that we just saw, The Joy Luck Club, and you played an 85-year-old dowager in um, The Last Emperor. And you had an Italian director and you had an Asian director. You had Bertolucci and you had Wayne Wang, who was uh, quite a bit younger. Um, how did it feel to be directed? Did uh, Bertolucci have that Chinese cultural background the same way that Wang would have had? I think Bertolucci studied a lot. Uh, um, he read the histories and uh, the personal uh, uh, book uh, of the emperor, and he did, he did his homework very, very well. Mm -hmm. So he was very well prepared. And it seemed that it was over a matter of years when you talked about it, several years yes, before he actually... Yes. Uh, Filmed it, mm -hmm. yes. And then yes. what about Wayne Wang, who is a relatively young yes. director? Uh, he's, uh, he's born, I think, in uh, Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and but he was brought up from here. So he's um, very Americanized, and yet he is uh, very well read in Chinese, I think. And they're both very sensitive, both um, very, uh, how do you say, sincere and uh, really per to the perfectionist, Are very they? meticulous. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very lucky to have worked with both of them. Did they each give you something to take away with you as, uh, as an actress? Oh, Bertolucci was uh, very charming. Uh, when I did my first scene, uh, he came over and he told me, he said, Lisa, you did just the right thing, not, not over, not under. Uh, <laughs> just one take. So Italian. Yeah, Italian. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And Wayne? Wayne is very nice, too, yes. Well, you've been very nice, and Thank we you. really appreciate having you with us today. We know it was, you're very busy, and, and if you're not collecting awards, <laughs> you're looking to do a one-woman show. We hope you do really well in that, thank and thank you. you. I'm going to Berkeley to do the one, uh, the Woman Warrior next month. Oh, great. Yes. So we'll keep looking for Lisa Liu now that we know you. <laughs> thank you. And don't go away, because we'll be back with writer-director Leslie Stevens. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with award-winning writer, director, Leslie Stevens. Leslie attended the Yale Drama School after winning a playwriting contest in Washington, D.C. 
He studied at the New School, as well as New York's American Theater Wing, with such great teachers and great theater names as Moss Hart, Harold Klerman, and Howard Lindsay. Leslie directed the Tony Award-winning Marriage Go Round, TV's The Outer Limits and It Takes a Thief, the movies The Left-Handed uh, Gun with Paul Newman and Heroes Island with James Mason, and then talking about great actors and all the great people you worked with, Leslie, you took some good advice from Orson Welles. What was that? Well, I, I was Orson's gopher for a little <laughs> while and then became an actual assistant with a play that was called Five Kings. It was a lot of Shakespeare. And I asked him one day, what's the best job of all in show business? Is it a producer, a star, you know, an actor? What is it? And he said, a playwright. He said, that. Uh, look at us, we're doing Shakespeare, and he's been dead 400 years, and he's still on. It's by far the best thing. So I said, okay, that's what I'll do, and that's what I did. So that was uh, the, the reason he was giving you such good advice, because you were working for him. I wondered how some young uh, person could come up to Orson Welles and ask him something well, I'd, like that. Well, I'd won a playwright contest in Washington. He didn't know that I had won that. And I was sitting in the audience and he said, go get me some donuts and, <laughs> and all the stuff that he liked to have, newspapers and things. And I did. And he thought I was with the company at first. And he used me all week long. And then suddenly it dawned on him that I wasn't with the company. So he hired me. And I was allowed to leave school and literally ran away and was with the uh, Mercury Theater there during that time. Oh, well, that's a great story. I was talking to um, one of the producers producers of this new play, Machiavelli, that you've written, Shakti Chen. Mm -hmm. And she was telling me that the reason she thought you were so good in these things is you had this, this background of classical training. So it must have started with Orson Welles. It certainly did. The, the lighting that's in the present show, the one that's on at the Court Theater now, uh, is sort of descendant of a great lighting artist called Jean Rosenthal that did all the Mercury Theater lighting. And she used to stand me on the stage as her little stand in there. And use that, mm -hmm. yeah. When, when you finished with Orson, did you go right to Off-Broadway? Um, well, there was a time in through there that I went to, there, a, a war intervened. Oh, I see, I see. <laughs> uh, and I became a captain in the Air Corps when I was 20, if you can imagine. Uh -huh. And then when I went on back into the theater where I really belonged, <laughs> they were in trouble with me in the war. But it still was uh, a whole life of something I wanted to do. And I studied a lot and then went into Off-Broadway with Bullfight. Was that, did you ride it? Was yes. That uh -huh. it? So, and then... Um, then I, I got lucky and went, went into Playhouse 90s. I, I, I well, then you a, went to, Ho was that I, in Hollywood uh, or no, New York? No, I was York? commuting then. Oh, you were? Yeah, and I wrote a lot of Playhouse 90s. Arthur Penn and uh, Frankenheimer and a lot of them directed it. They became very famous and then they kept hiring me for movies. That's why I wrote Paul Newman's uh, Left-Handed Gun is because I had worked with Arthur Penn who directed it on Playhouse 90s, a lot of them. Well, how, how did you make the transition from writing to directing then if you were so involved in the writing part of it? Well, I always wrote thinking that's what I really was, a playwright, a dramatist. And then I thought, well, I've got to protect mm. that person, so I started to direct. And then I found out that I had to protect that person, and I became a producer. And then I got a company called Daystar, where we did The Outer Limits and all those things, all to protect the writer, every bit of it. To, to protect And yourself. I couldn't protect him. I'm finally back around the back door now, coming back off Broadway in Equity Waiver Theater in order to do what I really want to do, which is to write the kind of plays I like to write. Oh, you were actually, in a way, forced into doing <laughs> was, what you did. Yes, the, the bluebird of happiness is really in your own backyard. <laughs> I've come full circle. Well, you talked about Playhouse 90, and when we were discussing all these wonderful things that you had done, I said, can you bring a clip from Playhouse 90? And you said, well, uh, they're hard to get. They're kinescopes, you know. And, and uh, I was digging through things, and I dug up pilot after pilot, you know, of McLeods and stuff. And it didn't look like anything particularly good, although a lot of them were 
directorial masterpieces. <laughs> or well, the thing, you said kinescope. I don't think any, I mean, nowadays, I don't think our viewers know what kinescope is. Well, it's a film record of the television. They were in black and white in those days, and there was no tape in those days, so they would simply record it on film, a little 16 millimeter film. That's what a kinescope is. And then they could broadcast that little film. I see. But they, could, they had no tape. It was really scary. You go on the air and, and in front of 30 million people, one take, and it would go wrong. I've seen great stars, Geraldine Page and uh, Annie Bancroft, in my shows, literally stand there and say, what's my next line? What do I do? <laughs> but there you are, live TV. At that oh, time, yes. it was live TV because they couldn't, I guess, kinescope. No you tape. Could... You couldn't use it. You went on live, and you went for 90 minutes live. One take. But I don't see how that's much different than an actor going on stage. It they, isn't. They go on live, don't they? I'm back. That's what I meant. I just decided that it's the most most exciting, the most fun, and a live audience with you. Now, now the, the show I'm doing right now, Machiavelli, has this wonderful give and take response. You can feel electricity in the house and mm -hmm. the actors get inspired every so often. Well, maybe that's the one thing that they didn't have on live TV. Did they have audiences? They did on some, like Milton Berle and those people did, mm -hmm. but uh, they didn't in the dramas, no. So they didn't get that playback. Well, but <laughs> you knew that you were in front of 30 million people, when that clock would go tick, 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 and then say on the air, you went, oh, Lord, we're in front of so many people. If we make a mistake, it'll be awful. So they were always aware of that. Yes. Could you stop and start no, again? Oh, no, no, no. no. straight no. through. <laughs> the, di the disasters were hysterical, too. The, the Lon Chaney Jr., remember him? He used to rehearse with a breakaway chair to hit a guard to go off stage, you know, escape from jail. And they told him, don't break up so many chairs, just pretend, <laughs> see, on the air. He went over without the chair and went like that. Like and the guard, <laughs> and this guard looked at him and said, what am I going to do? I can't fall down and look as though he's going to escape. So he pretended to faint. Oh, that was... <laughs> so you have to really be thinking. Oh. You? you did um, To Catch a Thief. Is that... Yes, the, that, that was Robert Wagner. Uh -huh. And that was like forever. That's it one ran thing seven people, years, sure. People do remember that. They all did, that. every one of them. You know, name of the Game, the, the, uh, Takes a Thief, uh, McLeod, later Battlestar Galactica, it goes on and on. The other thing that I think is so great, 30 years in syndication, the outer limits. Yes. That, How does that happen? Thir I mean, it's been playing for 30 years, yes. is that what that means? Oh, yes. And it still is. I mean, it goes on in the marathons out of Ted Turner's Superstation. And it's just, it's kind of like, you know, Rod Serling, who was also on Playhouse Night, he had uh, Twilight Zone. And I used to look at him in awe. I thought he was just sensational. And I, when I did The Outer Limits, I thought, it'd be nice if I were Rod Serling. So I said, do you need a host? And they said, yes, but not you. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did was, I, they said, come up with some idea. And that's when I said, there's nothing wrong with your television set. It turns off, you know, and the control voice comes on. I just said that out of the blue in an office. And they said, oh, that's interesting. Go ahead and do that. So that's how it was created. Right, you yeah. created it. You wrote it. And you directed, directed it. Everything, and yes. produced it. Yeah, the first, the first year. Uh -huh. And then you decided you should get some help? <laughs> well, I, I had a whole company, the Daystar Company. We had done Stony Burke, which was Jack Lord's first show before that, and then uh, did a lot of movies afterwards, movies of the week for NBC, Fred Silverman, and so on. And then I found out I'm a terrible businessman. I cannot handle everything. Executive producer is another world to me. So I gradually went back to what I really like to do, which is to write and then protect the writer by directing. And did you discover a lot of stars in The Outer Limits? Were there oh, uh, new people coming unbelievable in? Unbelievable people. I mean, Robert Duvall was on one. Uh, um, the people that were on early day star movies, Robert Redford had bit part, and, and right? they're just all through it. You can see them. Uh, Sir Cedric Hardwick did one that was just a wonderful one that uh, Joe Stefano wrote called the, sh the Form of Things Unknown, which is a Shakespearean quote. When you talk about s somebody else wrote something, and d did you bring in other writers? Did and oh, sure. Would you work with them, or would they have their own? Well, I always had to write the uh, beginnings and endings, where I the see. control voice would come in and give you a little moral at the oh, end, and I so see. on. I but see. I did a lot of the writing, a ton of it, in fact. And but I get tired. My gosh, there's 22 at a time with those shows, and I did them on all of them. See, I did the pilots, uh -huh. and then I do the first year. So I'd write an 
Oh, an awful lot of the I first see. blocks. I see. You have a new project right now, Machiavelli, which you wrote, yes. which surprised me because when I saw it, I it, it had that old feeling from Florence and of the Borgias and mm -hmm. of, of the way you staged it, I think. The murders happened with great lighting and different things. How, and time passes with a narrator, which mm -hmm. I think is brilliant. Tell us how that uh, came about. Well, the project. I, I realized that with the, with Machiavelli, nobody had ever done him, and I wondered why. And when I looked at all of his work, it spreads through so many years with the de Medici's and the Destes right. and the Borgias and so on. I thought the only way to do this is with the most dysfunctional family he worked with, which was the Borgias. And it was his first job. Oh, I see. I see. So what I did was to take all the research and take Machiavelli's participation as he was learning about a Renaissance prince mm -hmm. and discovering that you had to be treacherous and double dealing and bad faith and all kinds of things just to keep alive. And so he now reads to you June 12th, uh, 1492 or whatever it was, right. and goes into the scene and does whatever happened with the Borgias poisoning each other and, and a vicious fight between the brother and sister. I know, last night you were, the other day when we were watching uh, at the theater, you said, these people could go on any talk show and be a hit. <laughs> Oprah would love to have them tomorrow. <laughs> Sally, Jesse, Raphael, you know, they'd be sitting in a row up there. Did you read, a, did you do a lot of research? Oh, yes, I sure did. I spent months, literally, in looking at these great Renaissance paintings. That's why those costumes are something else. The costuming, the That staging. girl that did the costume is Norwegian and she has uh, dreadlocks and she's crazy as a loon. I, I don't mean that personally in any <laughs> way, but she's, she's artistically crazy. And uh, her stuff is just brilliant. I think that's worth seeing the show, if nothing else. Did, did you also move the people on the stage, sure. the choreography? Because yeah. it always looks like a painting. Yeah, well, that's deliberate to, to out of Renaissance paintings. When they sit down, one will be s uh, sitting sideways and the other draped right. around and wearing all those pearls and everything. And we tried hard to get that that kind of uh, compositional look of Renaissance work. It's a real Renaissance shot. We tried hard. Well, we did, we have run the whole gamut with you, Leslie Stevens. We thank you for being with us today. We've taken you from off-Broadway through all of your successes <laughs> back to and back yeah. to this little equity waiver theaters uh -huh. in Los Angeles. And I love it the most, too. Uh, <laughs> thanks for being with us. And thank you for being with us today on the Joan Quinn Profiles. We'll see you next time.